What's going on, bottom line viewers? It's Mitch here, here with a guest. We're going to talk some fantasy football, Fair Shake Football on Twitter. I've been following him on Twitter, on his podcast as well, and he talks fantasy, he talks real, like, football itself. He has great stats on his Twitter, and I've kind of become a fan of his podcast. It's just kind of started out. We're going to talk about that, but... Mostly here, we're going to talk fantasy. We're going to talk how you can approach your draft, players to target, players to avoid, all that sort of fun stuff, and just NFL-related topics. So yes. in regards to fantasy, man, I know I've been listening to a lot of your stuff, so I kind of know a lot of your takes, but I know a lot of people that watch me and subscribe to me don't, don't know. So there right. was two takes that I found very interesting that I wanted you to kind of elaborate on. And it has to do with two players and kind of two strategies, I would say, that you're taking into your draft. And one is in regards to Clyde Edwards-Hilaire, and the other is in regards <laughs> to DeAndre Hopkins. I found those two players uh -huh. very interesting when you talked about them, the, the most interesting. Probably especially yeah. for people that don't just look at fantasy or not fantasy experts, let's say, or fantasy uh, experience in fantasy probably people that just watch football know those names they want to draft them but what's your approach in regards to those two players first off when it comes to just overall football those guys are very very talented and and i want them on my team if we're talking real football most definitely but when it comes to fantasy for this season in particular i'm i'm a little bit more hesitant just based on where they're going you know what I mean? So obviously, I, I acknowledge the upside of Clyde edwards helaire I'll start with him. He has a tremendously high ceiling. You know, he could easily be a top five running back, even as a rookie at his position. He has the talent. He has the skills. He can be an every down back. He can catch. He can you can line him up pretty much anywhere. He actually reminds me a lot of Christian McCaffrey coming out. I'm worried in fantasy that his ADP is going to go up to you're pretty much going to have to take him in the first round unless you're maybe you get him early second round and with with the COVID-19 stuff going on I just think that's a very very risky move because we still haven't seen we don't know for certain how Andy Reid's going to utilize Clyde as a rookie will he start out slow I mean Christian McCaffrey was the number eight overall pick in that draft and he only had just over a thousand yards from scrimmage as a rookie so it's not unreasonable to assume that Clyde's going to have a year similar to that one, you know, whereas, so I think that's kind of, you could make an argument that that's his floor, but mm -hmm. if that's his floor, where, where does that, because I try to draft a guy for his floor and then also be mindful of his, his um, ceiling, the top 10 ceiling, probably top five, but his floor I think is more like a low end RB two somewhere in there first round. I'm just not going to do it because there are a lot of really good options yeah. In, uh, in round one, and especially at running back this year. It's deep in, at the top. And then for DeAndre Hopkins, I just think that that offense is exciting as it will be in real football. Again, Hopkins is one of the best receivers in football, no doubt. But I just think it, taking him at the end of the first round or early second round, even mid-second round to me, is almost certain to not provide value when it's all said and done. I just I don't think the volume will be there in that offense. I think that he'll be more in the 75 to 80 catch range. He'll be more dynamic. He'll average more yards per catch, score more touchdowns per reception than he did last year. I'm not excited about taking him that high. I think he could be this year's Odell Beckham Jr. from 2019. I made the mistake of drafting Odell last year in one, in right. one of my leagues. And the thing was, like, I was buying into the hype, and that's hard to do, you know. And, and I, now I've mm -hmm. learned about that, right? So it, it's really hard to do when you're, when you're buying into narratives, especially. And it's, it's weird this year in particular. Like, let's talk about that for a second, just the, the whole offseason. There's no preseason games, right? So right. the narratives and what coaches say and what you see in these 10-second videos in practice – mean that much more right. to us as fantasy drafters. So what advice do right. you give people in regards to that? The best piece of advice I can give is to is to basically prioritize experience this year, especially. You know, I mean you, that's pretty much true every year, but we need to 
this year in particular with the COVID, no preseason, teams are going to show us if a guy made nine bad plays and one great play, they're going to show us the great play and, and it's going to go more, you know, it'll be a viral piece of content. Or if your team has a bunch of like negative beat writers, they're going to show yeah. like Dwayne Haskins and Alex Smith thing. They're going to show the one, the one play where Alex threw a perfect ball and Dwayne Haskins didn't. And it's like, oh, see that? Haskins <laughs> sucks. We knew it. So it's just like you, you, you have to be careful what you, how much you put into that kind of stuff. And then also really heavily weigh on experience because I think NFL coaches, um, especially this year, are going to really rely on their veteran guys. And that mm -hmm. could mean that Darwin Thompson sees more of a role than Clyde edwards helaire at least early on, or more of a role than you think he should. You know, Because yeah. we're like, dude, Clyde's definitely the better player, obviously experience does matter especially when you can't get the guys on the field in preseason at all so strategy overall are you waiting on quarterback or are you waiting on tight end what's the strategy yes i'm i'm definitely always in favor of waiting on quarterback um i think that especially this year you have guys like matt stafford and daniel jones available in like the ninth tenth and maybe 11th rounds in some drafts it's crazy i'm more than content having Stafford just taking him in the ninth round because I know I can get him there and yeah. just hoping that he stays healthy but I, I think that um, I just think that value is so much better than taking somebody like Kyler Murray in the fifth or um, I mean Kyler has probably a higher ceiling maybe than Stafford he definitely has a high ceiling especially because what he can do with his legs but I just I'm not taking a, a fifth round quarterback I think the earliest I would consider quarterback is a seventh round this year, and I'd take somebody like Josh Allen there because what he can do with yeah. his legs. I mean, he's got more rushing touchdowns than any quarterback over the last two years, so he's still healthy and fresh and going into his prime. Josh Allen could have a huge year. But anyways, I'm waiting on tight end, too. I think at least till about around six or seven for tight ends as well. I'm trying to go running back very early, potentially even three straight running backs because rounds four – really four and on, but particularly four through nine or so are really loaded for receivers. I mean, you're going to be able to get legitimate receivers like Julian Edelman's available in like the seventh round. Guys like Tyler Boyd, Michael Gallup are available in the sixth, seventh round. Devontae Parker, you know, there are a ton of, of starting caliber re receivers. Like Brandon Cooks is available in the seventh or eighth round. That's crazy to me. You know what I mean? He's yeah. just, he's going to be a high, uh, I'd say at least a mid-range Worst case, a low end wide receiver too. So, to get that that late is just crazy, especially with when you can take, you can solidify your running back position early. I think that's just valuable. A couple of things you said there. So first, I know you're high on Josh Allen. Let's talk a little bit about Josh Allen because uh, I've been one of the people that have been de defending and kind of on the Josh Allen train for a very long time. Like since he was coming okay. out, I ranked him as my. Number two, I actually had Lamar first. So I had Lamar first okay. and Josh Allen second. And I was like all over. I wanted, you know, I wanted the Patriots to draft Lamar. Just side note. But right. I wanted um, Josh Allen, you that. know, to go probably. I thought he was probably the more <laughs> for sure prospect out of the two of them. Although I thought both of them had the highest ceiling out of all those prospects. So I thought Josh mm -hmm. Allen should have been the first quarterback drafted by the Browns, let's say. So... And I've been a fan of him, and people just continue to have their narratives about him, like the completion percentage thing. It's the same thing we see with Cam Newton that I'm having to constantly yes. defend now because he's my right. quarterback, the Patriots fan. Yep. So, yep. yeah, just give your thoughts on Josh Allen, both from a fantasy perspective and from like a real-life perspective as well. Coming out of that draft class, I actually had him and Baker Mayfield. I was going back and forth on who my quarterback one was and the only reason I went with Baker ultimately as my final quarterback one was because of the I thought Baker was more ready to play right away yeah. and with Allen he had more physical traits definitely but he I said he needed two years when he was coming out I was like he needs two years to really start to look like who he's really going to become in my opinion he's actually ahead of schedule and I'm not someone that's going to value completion percentage a whole lot because <laughs> I mean, you have to take it all into context. Like, look yeah. at the receivers he's been working with. John Brown and Cole Beasley had very close to, if not their best seasons ever last year. And that offensive line was a lot of new pieces. Mm -hmm. They are now – they have some continuity built up. They have great depth along that line. You know, so – and now they have Stephon Diggs in the mix. It's a uh, – it's a perfect blend of young guys and veterans. And Josh Allen, to me, is – 
top three in terms of physical talent in the entire NFL. I was that high on Josh Allen, but I didn't even think he could run. Like, I thought he could oh, run really? decently well. But I wasn't, <laughs> like, that wasn't really on my mind all that much. I thought, yeah. like, yeah, he can run. Kind of like Carson Wentz. Like, yeah, he can run. But okay. you don't think of him, like, being as good of a runner almost as, like, early Cam Newton. You know, like, yeah. that's what he looks like now. I didn't see that coming. I thought he was athletic for sure. But I didn't think he was, you know, going to lead the NFL in touchdowns by a quarterback over his first two years. That's crazy. And then you see it on his best throws, which happened a lot more last year. You see undeniable talent. You know, you really do. There's a chance he could be in the MVP race, in my opinion. I just think he's that talented. Yeah, it's kind of odd to me, like, how the people have this the narrative of of people or quarterbacks with big arms and, and the abil- the athletic mm-hmm. ability has cha- changed so much like i i feel like mm-hmm. back in the day before maybe even i was a football fan it was all about the physical ability of the quarterback to throw the football and to run around and make plays but now right. it's all about like the the accuracy and the efficiency and and maybe that has to do with the analytical world of the nfl but i think people don't take mm-hmm. into account the impact that that athlete has on an offense just from what he can right. do physically that other players cannot do and yeah i actually comped allen to cam newton like I, that's what oh, i wow. saw that's what i you saw, saw it. <laughs> yeah i saw yeah. it like completely right. and i saw the arm like the first time i watched him i was like holy like this guy has an arm i've never seen right so yeah when you have those <clears throat> special gifts the bills are definitely going to be dangerous with that defense as well cam let's talk about cam we've been talking a little bit about yeah. him so you are a panthers fan and yes. just give maybe patriots fans your perspective as well as your thoughts on him in fantasy where you're drafting him if you're going to be drafting him this year definitely happy to draft cam at his current adp which is like the 11th round i think that's just another reason why you shouldn't take quarterback early i mean that's a steal like if cam stays healthy he's going to be a top 10 quarterback in fantasy. Like, it's almost certain. And to get him in the 11th round and then to grab a guy like, I don't know, Julian Edelman or something like that in the 5th or 6th, any of those receivers or even a running back, another running back like Jonathan Taylor, the value there really, really makes sense to me. But in terms of Cam, the one thing I'd use to describe Cam, and and I'm going to use this one particular description because no one really thinks of him this way, Cam Newton is a team first guy. Like if you people think about him and they're, they make fun of his outfits and this, that, and the other. But if you really are a fan, and most Panther fans will attest to this, when you see Cam on the sidelines dancing and laughing and having a great time, that's because they're winning. So if he's winning, he has three interceptions in an awful game. You see the same dude dancing as as he as when he has five touchdowns in a great game. He's the same way. He does yeah. not care he just wants to win he's willing to do whatever it takes to win I really think the coaching staff will like him a lot there and I think it's going to be interesting to a lot of people because I think I think he'll bring out a weird sense of humor type of side of Bill Belichick because he just has the certain type of personality that's just like you you love him you know if he stays healthy I don't see I don't see how they're not going to make the playoffs and I don't see how he's not going to have a big year because he's ultra motivated right now all right, man. That that sounds good for me. I'm looking forward to it because I'm <laughs> I'm skeptical about this Patriots team. This is is on paper the most questions I've seen for this Patriots organization for in a long sure. time. Cam is one you're targeting in the late rounds. Matt Stafford, you mentioned definitely. Yeah. Who are the guys that in those you know seventh you said to like the later rounds that you are targeting outside of those three? Are there any others, <laughs> or are those the guys that are on most of your teams? Brandon Cooks might be the best value pick at the receiver position in the entire fantasy draft this year. For All right. Why? Why? Alone. I just really think like DeAndre Hopkins, if I remember correctly, was targeted 150 times last year. Okay. And that was like not even a necessarily his highest year. Brandon Cooks is going to, is going to see a guaranteed like 120 targets. And I, and I think the way the Texans used Hopkins last year was in a way that I think Brandon Cooks would be, better at because it was a lot of short stuff quick game whereas i think hopkins Mm -hmm. needs to be utilized more of how he'll be utilized in arizona more you know 50 50 ball situations deep to intermediate that's why i think volume will be less in arizona i see cooks taking that exact role which will be a lot of like quick screens a lot of quick slants underneath stuff and i think um 
I mixed in with some intermediate to deep stuff as well. But I just think Brandon Cooks is only 27, I believe. Yeah, I think he had four consecutive 1,000-yard seasons on three different teams, uh, once with your Patriots and then the Saints and the Rams. So, like, the guy can still play. The only question is, like, if he gets a concussion, that'll definitely hurt you. But And he's available in, like, 7th, 8th, ninth, even. Um, I think that's that's stealing. He's going to be Houston's number one receiver. So he's got Deshaun Watson. You think and, so? Um, there's a hundred. Yeah, I really do. I right. Definitely think so. I'm, I'm kind of more on the Will Fuller train this year. Uh, maybe I'm just I'm buying the hype maybe too much, but I, I do feel like Will Fuller, he's finally going to get his opportunity to be that number one guy as long as he can stay healthy. But I do think it's going to be a nice mix there in Houston. I mean. They Definitely. did bring in Randall Cobb. They still have Kenny Stills. And from what I've seen from Cooks over his career, I mean, he's a superb, like, mid to deep route runner. His speed just threatens corners. So everything, yeah. like comebacks, like cur- all that stuff is going to be open for him all day. So I definitely think he is a guy to target. Like, I'm targeting both of those guys, to be honest with you. Where they're going in the yeah. draft, there's way too much upside to not go after them. Brandon Cooks, as your guy that you're targeting, probably your favorite guy this year. Is there another guy that you're trying to leave every draft with? So Jalen Rieger is a guy that I'm okay. really excited about because I honestly think he's their best receiver, even as a rookie. And just his price, I think, is the 11th round, if I'm remembering that correctly, because He's going to a situation with a legit quarterback, like an established veteran quarterback who we know can get the ball to his, you know, outside receivers. Rieger also brings a style of play similar to like DJ Moore, where it's like he can line up in the slot. He can line up outside. You can hand it to him, reverse, end around. You can push it downfield. He can win some 50-50 balls. So I think Jalen Rieger in the 11th round or so is a really, really good value. Um, I also like Henry Ruggs. Yes. I think – those two rookies are, are exciting. Um, and, uh, yeah, man, there's, there's just a lot of receivers in that range. And, and I think so basically I did a podcast on this too, but basically the way I see the draft is first two, preferably three rounds, you should be able to land running backs there. Mm -hmm. And then third through eighth round should be mostly receivers with the exception of Jonathan Taylor, David Montgomery, and like the fifth round i like those guys i think montgomery will have a much better season this year around round seven eight nine you can start looking at quarterback but i wouldn't necessarily draft one unless it's josh allen in the seventh i'm fine with that because i think you'll be potentially getting something like a lamar jackson last year but i think his floor is just what we saw from him last year which was yeah. really like a top seven or eight quarterback in fantasy you know especially with what he can do with his legs that brings that floor way up there so i'm happy to take him in the seventh but if not then i'll take safford or daniel jones in the ninth or tenth and uh seven eight nine you can start looking at tight end as well but there are going to be legitimate starting tight end options in rounds 10 or even later like tj hawkinson austin hooper you know guys like that hayden hurst i love he'll be available in like round eight or nine i think and then after that it's just then you start really and some young guys like Jalen Rieger in the double-digit rounds, Henry Ruggs, Jerry Judy, I think will have a pretty high floor for a uh, rookie receiver. Then you can get even high floor guys like Adrian Peterson in like the 13th round. So that's just kind of how I how yeah. I see it. Running back early, receiver, and then just kind of mix it out the rest of the way. Yeah, I, I agree with that for the most part. I, I do think that third round is probably the most interesting round that I think can not necessarily break your draft, but if you hit in that third round, I feel like it can make your draft this year because there's so many running backs in particular that are so question filled. There's so many of them that have yes. like high upside and, and maybe a lot of guys that we've seen it before, like top 10 guys in the past or even top one guys like Le'Veon Bell in the past, but guys that right. I feel like Man, if you don't hit, that, that's going to hurt. So in that third round, in particular, the running back position, I'm mostly avoiding it. But like, is there a player or two in that third, fourth-ish round that you are targeting if they're there? Definitely. Um, I'm, I'm going to take Leonard Fournette if he's there. Okay. And he will be most of the time if it's early to mid. Um, I'm, I'm comfortable with that because Fournette, a lot of people don't realize, had – 100 targets last year you know so 100 targets for a guy that um we know is going to carry the ball 
17 plus times a game. I don't really know if they'll be much worse than they were last year. And even if they are, I think when he, the fact that he got a hundred targets, he was targeted a hundred times. That shows you that they're willing to throw him the ball. And so he wasn't a great receiver and I understand they got Chris Thompson, but I still think he'll be on the field enough to justify a third round pick. That's interesting. Cause I, I have been mostly fading Fournette just because of the situation in, in Jacksonville, just because I don't mm-hmm. have confidence in the Jags. I do yeah. kind of like Chark and Minshew, though. And yeah. They that, have some weapons. It's kind of sneaky. Yeah, you know, yeah. Kinda... Their, their offense, I guess, kind of makes it interesting for fantasy purposes because I think they'll be losing a lot, which leads to more passing. Are there any right. like late, deep sleepers like maybe a Gardner Minshew, like a guy that's on a bad team? But you see, like, maybe he has a better fantasy season than a real-life season. Uh, Antonio Gibson is a guy that I like really late. The majority of the decisions were made by Ron Rivera this year. And he took Antonio Gibson with his second pick. And, and that was when they had perceived depth at that position. Of course, now yeah. Darius Geis is gone or whatever. But Adrian Peterson is, to me, the high-floor, safe, late option there. But Antonio Gibson is a guy that I think, especially in PPR leagues, you need to have on your team just because it's so late. And I think his ceiling is, you know, very high. Van Jefferson is interesting. You okay. may not even have to draft Van Jefferson, but he's a guy that I'm interested in in that in that late part of the draft um, as well. Really, that's when I want to take the young guys. Like, I don't have a problem drafting rookies, but I want to do it where I feel like it's safe. You know, like Clyde edwards Lair definitely could pay off big time. But you, what you're doing if you take him in the late first is you're accepting the risk of not getting value on your first round pick. And that's just something I'm really, really trying to avoid. I don't want any risk with my first and second round picks, especially in and even into the third round. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think that after that, Jonathan Taylor in the fourth or fifth round is awesome. Guys like that. I think Odell Beckham and Le'Veon Bell and David mm-hmm. Johnson are all guys that have rebound seasons this year and they're available i believe in the fourth and fifth rounds that is potentially really good value and i think that those all those guys will have relatively high floors to the point where if you take them in the fourth round and they only reach their floor i think that's okay with the amount of volume they'll see in their offenses and um, yeah yeah i'm really excited juju smith schuster i like him a lot too right there in round four i really like the way this this year's draft is shaping up in terms of just perception of some players versus where I where I personally value them, I think that there's there's definitely value to be had there. Last question, not fantasy related. I want to know about the Panthers, bro. I want to know how they're gonna do this year. Are are they gonna stink? Are they gonna surprise people? <laughs> Let the people know how the Panthers gonna do. I'm usually the most optimistic and ever. Okay, but this year in particular, I'm gonna be a little bit more harsh on them because Matt Rule, I hope he's a great coach, but he didn't have a, a sustained success history coming out of college. He, he turned around some programs and had a, a successful year, maybe two, and then got this big job for a seven-year commitment in the NFL. So I thought they made a big mistake letting letting Cam Newton go and, and uh, go on Teddy Bridgewater. I think it's like, what's the ceiling from Bridgewater? I agree if with you, that. <laughs> if you want to just, yeah, if you want to just play it out and if Cam gets hurt and you suck, well, okay, then then you can probably likely get that quarterback of the future, you know, in the coming years. But you still had Cam under contract for another year for seventeen million, I believe it was. So you, you paid him two million. You're gonna win maybe six games or so, somewhere in that range, five to seven games. So now it's gonna be even more difficult to get that quarterback of the future. Whereas if you just stuck it out with Cam, you might be in the playoffs in twenty twenty. And if he got hurt and he, you know, or he just played horribly, you would you would be more likely to be up there in that in that top 10 of the draft range i think the panthers defense is going to be pretty rough they're young and and promising in the future right away i mean they were bad last year and they let seven starters walk including they didn't let luke keekly walk but he's one of those seven so to lose seven starters and then to replace them essentially with a lot of rookies and then to hear whitehead where if you just look at what his numbers were when targeted last year they were very very bad i can't remember exactly but It was somewhere in the 140 to 150 passer rating allowed. They have a lot of young, talented guys, but I think it's going to be, it's going to require patience. Yeah, I'd probably agree with that. I mean, I think they're probably looking at a top five pick. I think that would be 
pretty safe to say, but I'm not sure. Maybe they surprise. Yeah. And I, I do agree with your take on they should have kept Cam, especially at his contract. That was the confusing part to me. Right. Like, I would have kept Cam. He has one year left. So if he does well, he does well. You look good as a rookie coach. But you could have also mm-hmm. brought in, instead of paying like Teddy Bridgewater, you could have brought in like Jameis Winston if you wanted, or like Andy Dalton. I mean, yeah. those guys are out there for right. no money at all. Right. So if Cam does get hurt, I mean, you have a guy to go with, and maybe you see what Jameis is in your system. And, you know, we know he has talent. He's just kind of a dummy, but, <laughs> you know, so you right. can see what's up with the, yeah. the quarterback position there and still be rebuilding at the same time, potentially. And Cam could be playing motivated for that next contract coming off injury. So right. you wouldn't have any incentive to carry or put a team around him to go to the playoffs, to go to the Super Bowl. It definitely was a quick turnaround. I think they did like Teddy personally because he is, from what everyone says, you know, a good leader, a good face of the franchise, right. a good and guy. He's a fit in that offense. He has experience in that offense mm-hmm. as well. So that, I think that played a part. But in my opinion, he's not going to be better than Cam Newton. If Cam stays healthy, you're, you, you're, you're going to be in the playoff mix. I mean, that is the truth of it. Because when he's at his best, he his stats may not always show exactly what, you, what you'd like to see. But his team is always in the thick of things when it comes to winning on a weekly basis. So it's interesting to me. I mean, Teddy, like, are we expecting that Teddy Bridgewater is going to be a legit franchise quarterback that we can build around for the future? Like, I mean... I think he's. I think he is who he is. He's a solid quarterback. He's just not, you know, he's nothing special, really. I think that. Um, I think now that said, he does have a chance to really be decent in this offense with these weapons. Mm-hmm. But I still just don't see the ceiling. And it's not like Cam Newton is some old guy. You know, he's like 31 years old, just turned 31, I believe. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just uh, interesting. I'm rooting for him. Always gonna root for him, but I'm worried a little bit. All right, man. So let's plug your stuff. Where can they find you, your podcast, uh, you on social media, Twitter, Instagram? Let the people know where they can find you, how they can follow you. Cool. So on Twitter, I'm at FairShakeFB for football. Um, on Instagram, I'm at FairShakeFootball. And um, podcast right now is available. Like I said, I'm doing two episodes per day on the weekdays. I'm going for that. Some days I fall a little short. But um, it's on Spotify right now. It's on Anchor and Google, and I'm about to have it on the Apple Apple Podcast as right. well. So it's just Fair Shake Football Podcast. Um, so, yeah. Awesome, man. I've been listening. Again, guys, go check them out. I've been listening to every episode, especially the fantasy-related stuff. You know, I like to take as many opinions in as possible when it comes to any NFL stuff. I like to just fill myself with stuff that I can regurgitate to you guys. No, just kidding. But <laughs> ultimately, form your own opinion. That's the that's my that's my insight I can give everyone out there in regards to fantasy. Or if you want to learn about the NFL, listen to as many people that you deem to be smart about talking about this stuff. And I knew that he had a little bit to offer when it came to Twitter, uh, putting out interesting statistics and stuff. We had some conversations. I think a couple of my subscribers already follow you on Twitter because of our conversations on Twitter. So. That's kind of interesting. Uh, We'll have to have you on in the future. Maybe we can have you on for some fantasy stuff, but thanks for joining us, man. Sure, man. Thanks for having me, bro. Appreciate it. All right. Peace, guys.